Hello, good morning. I'm Ashok Rokade, consultant rhinologist and Andreas Kalbis surgeon from Winchester and the University Hospital Southampton, UK. I welcome colleagues from around the world on behalf of organizing team to this inaugural Winter Global Rhinology Endoscopic Sinus and Andreas Kalbis Surgery Webathon. Global Rhinology Network is a registered non-profit organization with a mission to foster surgical education in rhinology and skull base surgery. We have successfully hosted annual multi-center live surgical webcast, The Lioness, since 2014 in collaboration with Lion Foundation. Thousands of surgeons from all corners of the world have benefited from it. More than 2,000 surgeons from 110 countries have registered for GRACE 2020. We will have hugely informative and engaging sessions presented by eminent rhinologists and skull base surgeons from around the world. GRACE 2020 is hosted at the Global Telemedicine Studio of Professor Wilco Gronman in Utrecht in Netherlands. It is supported by Medtronic and Carl Stores. Thank you. Imagine, what if you could do even more to bring relief to your chronic rhinosinusitis patients with technology customized to your unique clinical and facility needs? Introducing Stealth Station Flex ENT Navigation System, a customizable system from Medtronic ENT, a market leader in image-guided surgery technology. Featuring six hardware configurations, an optional portable card, two different electromagnetic emitter options, with flexibility in hardware design and optional software functionality. Get everything you need and nothing you don't with Stealth Station Flex ENT. Let's flex forward. Contact your Medtronic representative to customize a navigation solution that's right for you. Um, Professor Ken Mecca um, from Ankara. Okay, so he's going to talk to us about inverted papilloma and management. Welcome, Ken. How Thank are you? you? Very much. Right. Great talks. Okay, lovely uh, to see you. Good. 
great talk we have been hearing since early in the morning i'm trying to follow uh all of them um just sharing my screen um uh it's a great pleasure to be with you once again uh and okay here uh first of all i would like to uh thank uh the organizers and specifically to Ashok uh, for uh, the kind invitation uh, to give me the chance to uh, share our experience uh, on how we manage uh, inverted papillomas in our institution. Uh, I have no, uh, oops, I have no, uh, nothing to disclose except for being the president of the European Confederation of Otorhinolaryngology. And using this chance, I'd like to remind uh, all participants uh, that the, um, due, the dates have been changed uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the, the big meeting in Milano will be in, in late uh, uh, autumn in 2022. Please say the date. We are looking forward to me, uh, meet all of you there, hopefully in person at that time. Uh, and okay. Uh, as we all know, inverted papillomas uh, are rare epithelial benign senonasal tumors with an incidence of uh, 0 0.6 to 1.5 per 100,000. And uh, they're the most common benign tumor of the senonasal cavity. Uh, almost less than 4% of all surgically removed tumors in the uh, uh, paranasal uh, area. Uh, they, are, they are up to two to five times more common in men and the highest incidence is in the fifth and sixth decades. And they are generally unilateral, but we should all always know that up to 9% they could be uh, multifocal Thus, uh, the, uh, there is a chance for a bilaterality. Um, so uh, they have three histologic types and they're locally aggressive uh, tumors and they have a tendency to recur. For us in the clinical uh, management, it's important to know the association with malignancy uh, up to uh, ten, uh, we we, make, we can find up to ten percent of uh, carcinomas, uh, from which uh, seven percent are synchronous and 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 three percent are metachronous. So that makes it important to follow these patients uh, lifelong. Uh, another important uh, uh, thing is the the uh, tendency to recur. This is a big problem uh, in the clinical life uh, and in, in clinical reports, it could be up to 80% uh, being reported in the literature. Um, and if it's recurred, it, the majority is within the nine months. Um, and there are some risk factors being uh, delineated in the, in the position paper, European position paper on endoscopic management of tumors. Uh, of the nose paranasal uh, sinuses, uh, of, of which that the localization uh, and involvement of different areas is a risk factor, histology, multicentricity, the surgical technique that is being used, and the completeness of, of the resection. Uh, in this uh, study uh, that uh, really looks to these risk factors in 170, uh, uh, 27 patients. The recurrence have been found in general in 12%, but as you can see, half of the patients have recurred if only a stripping of the mucosa have been done. So that uh, simply implies that uh, we have to do a subperiosteal dissection. And, and uh, if we also combine a drilling of the bone of the attachment zone and cauterization, uh, the, then the uh, uh, recurrence reduces to 5%. Uh, and uh, with radical resection, it, it comes uh, uh, to 0%. This attachment-oriented uh, endoscopic surgical strategy 
is is important as as also stated by the group of uh, Dan Fliss. Uh, most recurrences occur when the surgeon had not appropriately dealt with the side of tumor uh, attachment. So in a way, assuming that the tumor emerges from the medial maxillary wall in most cases by concentrating only performing a complete medical uh, medial uh, maxillectomy and not searching uh, for the precise location of tumor origin, uh, the surgeon is likely to miss other potential sites of tumor origin. Uh, and thus, the concept of site of origin is very important. And this uh, analysis of um, 200 cases, uh, as you can see, uh, nearly 80% of the cases are uh, originating from the lateral nasal wall, either from the etmoid cells or maxillary sinus or inferior turbinate. Uh, the sphenoid sinus and frontal sinus is, is a less uh, problem, but will, are very challenging. I'll also mention about that, uh, those. And uh, a good uh, thing about this tumor is that its growth pattern is by displacing the adjacent structures or intact mucosa um, and, and invasion is, is really rare. Uh, if it touches other places. So its attachment is the, uh, is the real place. So um, the frontal sinus, uh, inverted papillomas, at least in our practice, have been more uh, common, uh, as you can see, uh, up to nearly 8% uh, in our cohort uh, since 2005, in 106 patients. But again, it's the same thing, the uh, lateral um, um, maxillary uh, nasal wall is, is the, the most common place also in, in our cohort. So uh, for diagnosis, CT scan is, is the first uh, that we do. It's, as you can see, it's a soft, uh, unilateral soft tissue, and there are some calcifications within papilloma, but the most important finding is the hyperosteosis, which is found in up to 90%, uh, and, and it's a prediction of where it attaches and the diagnosis in up to 95% of the uh, patients. But uh, here, as you can see, the hyperosteosis in this, in this uh, case. But whenever we see some kind of a bone erosion, it should be an alarming signal for us if there is like, some kind of a malignancy incorporated in the inverted papilloma, we should be really checking uh, that. And, we check all of those with the uh, MRI scanning. Um, as you can see uh, on T1 scans, it's, a, it's, a, it's an iso-intense uh, mass. And uh, on T2, it's a hyper-intense uh, uh, mass. And more importantly, in, in T1s with a contrast and uh, with, uh, on, on T2s, you see these co uh, convoluted cerebriform patterns which really guides us to the attachment point. Uh, and, and when we use that with the uh, combination of the CT, we can really predict where it is attaching. It is also very important, as in this case, you see uh, on the CT scan, you cannot really uh, understand which portion is the tumor and which portion is the uh, 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 mucus that is retained due to the uh, tumor involvement uh, with the use of the MRI, we can clearly delineate uh, the, these, uh, and with this uh, uh, attachment zone uh, on T2 uh, images, we can really uh, get it. And there are a couple of uh, studies being done uh, showing how accurate we can really predict uh, before surgery, the attachment zone uh, also. In, in this study uh, from IFAR from 2016, uh, from a ch Chinese group, uh, up to 90, uh, uh, more than 95% in, with the combination of CT and MRI, we can really determine uh, the, the, uh, the diagnosis accuracy only by using the combination of CT and, and MRI. And here you see the convoluted cerebriform pattern and on the CT in the same region, we would see the hyperostosis that really shows us uh, the uh, attachment point so that we can plan our uh, uh, surgery. So using the uh, CT and MRI, we're actually doing only the mapping for any 
a synanasal tumor, actually, uh, we could uh, uh, we need the uh, the typing there. For that, we need to take a biopsy. And for benign tumors, actually, these, this is adequate. Uh, if we encounter a carcinoma, then we can run uh, the rest. But even for biopsy, there, we have some, some problems. Uh, we may not get representative uh, biopsy. It's not always uh, uh, definitive histology revealed. If the, if the biopsy result comes a benign tissue, but there are radiologic criteria for a carcinoma, it's always good to take a second biopsy under general anesthesia. And sometimes biopsy is not possible because of the location, like the far lateral frontal sinus IPs, or uh, in such cases, we may reach the uh, uh, diagnosis intraoperatively but with frozen sections, or if sometimes uh, we uh, the definitive histology, like a, a a uh, synchronous carcinoma comes uh, first after the uh, uh, operation. So because of this uh, problems, uh, the management of IP have been traditionally uh, uh, um, uh, made with, with open approaches like uh, carcinomas uh, and aiming the complete surgical removal uh, uh, using uh, different uh, open techniques which I have also done uh, early in my career uh, with using the osteoplastic flaps and, and uh, really like uh, uh, malignant tumor surgery because of the problems that I have uh, already tell. But with the emergence of the uh, endoscopic techniques, uh, now according to the area we have been uh, that is uh, involved, we have been doing different uh, uh, kinds of surgeries but in all of them, we do subperiosteal total resection with bony uh, removal and drilling of the uh, attachment site. Uh, so the surgical aim is principally always the same. So we aim the total resection of the lesion and block is rarely feasible through the endoscopic approach. We do it piecemeal, uh, creating wide, easy uh, uh, to observe cavities. And this is, feasible according to the physiopathology origin, localization and relation uh, uh, to the important uh, structures and naturally benign tumors are the best to address in, in such way. Uh, and for especially for uh, inverted papilloma, as I've already mentioned, uh, we need to do a subperiosteal total resection and drilling uh, of the attachment site in order to reduce uh, the recurrences to a minimum. Um, Surgical technique is, uh, uh, is important in that sense with uh, recurrences, as you can see with uh, polypo uh, polypectomy, limited lesions, its recurrence is very high. The traditional methods are, uh, uh, have used to have a 16% uh, recurrency with the endoscopic techniques uh, in, in this position paper. Uh, it has been stated it's 14%, uh, uh, but uh, the, as it has became the more standard uh, therapy, uh, uh, like in this uh, paper from the group of uh, Philippe Herman, uh, recurrence rates have been in, in 12 months reported as 3.3. Uh, so um, it is also important when we are operating, uh, if we do operate on residual uh, uh, tumors, the recurrence rate uh, would be as high as uh, almost as one third of the patients uh, in compa compared to primary ones. And uh, really in, in primary cases using the endoscopic technique, uh, uh, around 10 to 12% uh, has been reported in, in, in this uh, paper uh, of, a, of the analysis of a single center's uh, uh, follow-up uh, results. So today, endoscopic surgery became the standard approach whenever possible, but long-term follow-ups are uh, uh, important because of the uh, factors that I have already mentioned, uh, also including uh, mucosal formation. Um, so uh, this is an example of a right lateral nasal wall uh, uh, inverted papilloma, and as you can see here is the side of the um, uh, hyperosteosis, and, and this is extending to the uh, uh, sphenoid sinus back, uh, and in, uh, frontal sinus, and maxillary sinus, but we can de delineate with uh, much more better with the 
uh, with the MRI. And again, here you see the convoluted cerebriform pattern attaching exactly the uh, place of the um, uh, hyperosteosis. So in, during the surgery, we f first do uh, the uh, debulking, uh, piecemeal debulking, and we, we really uh, then try to uh, find our uh, surgical landmarks. And this is the onsenet process here. Uh, we're gonna uh, in, incise the uh, incinet process. And here, this, this is the mu mucus retention in the uh, maxillary uh, sinus in this case. And then uh, we're gonna do a subperiosteal uh, dissection and this is the attachment point, as you can see. It's very nice to see, uh, you can, one can uh, see the hyperosteosis region. Then we complete our uh, surgery to a total sphenoidomyodectomy, removing all the uh, portions uh, from the frontal sinus. As you can see, this is a retained mucosa. The extension have been taken out uh, till to the sphenoid sinus. And then it is important to really drill out the hyperosteotic uh, bone uh, and, and, and really uh, get rid of all the disease. Uh, uh, and, and also for the frontal sinus, uh, this is a nasal cell and this, is, uh, the, uh, this has been converted into a draft type 2 uh, B. It's very important to send the whole material to the uh, pathology uh, to search for uh, synchronous uh, carcinoma. Uh, because that happens. And uh, if you are lucky enough to get the, uh, uh, the diagnosis during uh, the biopsy, uh, even if this is a very small one, uh, inverse papilloma, uh, 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 you, you can be more prepared and tailor your surgery according to the, uh, according to the um, uh, um, uh, carcinoma. So we are going to uh, do a, a, a piecemeal debulking, not a, a touching the, the main uh, portion uh, of the attachment side. Uh, then, uh, as you can see, we, we do, as it comes very near to the uh, tumor, we are dissecting the uh, nasolacrimal duct. And then on the other side, we dissect and see the region where it is attached uh, on the lateral side. Uh, or, uh, and then we, we're going to be removing uh, everything. And it is important to remove really everything uh, uh, um, on one piece and uh, block the, uh, the attachment side. So, but... Uh, if the attachment uh, is confined and the, all the rest of the mucosa is uh, normal, we can just go and uh, don't touch the, whole, the rest of the mucosa and just uh, do the superiosteal uh, total resection at the site of attachment and do our uh, drilling, uh, which would increase the quality of life of the patients. Uh, and also, I will not really address, as it has been already addressed uh, in the morning, uh, on the types of uh, partial maxillectomy, uh, which could be used. For this phenoid sinus, uh, we should also tailor uh, our, our approach according to the attachment location. Um, uh, and it could be really challenging if we have uh, on the lateral wall, especially in case of a uh, plumatization of the anterior clinoid process and involved of the optical carotid recess, uh, as you can see from these uh, cadaveric dissections. Here in this patient, for example, between the optic and the uh, internal carotid artery, uh, we had uh, such a uh, patient. So this is the optic nerve, this is the carotid artery. So the attachment is exactly in the uh, optical carotid recess and that was really not uh, fun to uh, get rid of that uh, tumor at that location uh, done by my colleague, Dr. Kitschuk. Um, so this is um, uh, also very important, the challenging uh, portion at the frontal sinus. Uh, it is very important to assess uh, the, the excess 
to the tumor attachment, uh, if it is medial or lateral, and the anatomic variations of the frontal sinus really determine the accessibility. Uh, uh, we require the biggest opening achievable done by the uh, draft procedures, but if the attachment is on the anterior wall, we really need the, uh, uh, a, a bigger anterior posterior distance to be able to manipulate around the lesion. And, and uh, if, if the attachment is at the posterior wall, lateral recess, concavity of the anterior fossa and well pneumatized sinuses could be problematic to reach uh, endoscopically. And if, if, if the tumor attachment is at the supraorbital recess or orbital roof, uh, uh, and this area is even very hard to uh, manage uh, with the open approaches because of the very narrow edge between the anterior fossa and the orbital roof as it gets very narrow uh, posterior. So experience is uh, required and in instrumentation is imperative to operate around the frontal sinus. And uh, with the draft techniques, they uh, let us uh, these ease of access and enhance our manipulation capability around the lesions and leave adequate drainage, post-operative, but they might not be really adequate. Uh, and we may need additional techniques like the, the technique uh, uh, reported by uh, the group in Barista by Professor Castelnuovo, the orbital transposition technique, or uh, from our American colleagues, the group of uh, Dr. Uh, Pauxos, the medial superior orbital uh, decompression. So principally with this compression, we do uh, uh, suspend periorbital uh, laterally to transpose orbita. Uh, so we have been also using this technique since uh, uh, now 10 years, and among those, uh, four of them have been uh, inverted papillomas. We have also uh, reported the, these uh, in different places. So principally, especially in well-aerated frontal sinuses and supraorbital recesses, we cannot really reach uh, the area behind the uh, midline. Uh, here, the anterior ethmoidal artery plays a very important role. Uh, as you can see, it's the only medial attachment uh, of the periorbita medially. If we take it out, then we can uh, decompress uh, the superior medial walls and then uh, trans uh, suspend periorbita laterally to transpose uh, orbita so that we can reach that area. And for inverted papilloma, it's important to, that we can reach to drill uh, in, that, in that area. Uh, so. Uh, this is the anterior ethmoidal artery that holds the periorbita here. And when we cut that, we can really see uh, and, and reach to the very lateral portion. Uh, and this is the situs from the, the, from the, the, during the uh, surgery. So I've already told the IP is originating from uh, elsewhere, but if the IP is originating from the frontal recess or the medial supraorbital recess, uh, that could be more problematic. I will not uh, mention the first one, but directly go to the uh, other one, like in this case. Uh, uh, sorry, as you can see, the, uh, the hyperosteosis is as at the frontal recess with the middle turbinate, and, and the tumor gets into the supraorbital uh, recess as confirmed by the uh, MRI. Um, so uh, during uh, the case, again, after uh, debulking, uh, uh, and uh, opening up the frontal sinus. This is the anterior ethmoidal artery, as you can see, and it's getting into the supraorbital recess. Uh, we do uh, coagulate then the posterior ethmoidal artery and the anterior uh, ethmoidal artery and remove the tumors uh, here uh, and, and, and uh, then uh, get the tumor out. But we still have uh, uh, tumor in the supraorbital recess in this narrow cleft. And, and for that, uh, as we have already uh, uh, coagulated anterior ethmoid artery, we can dissect the periorbita uh, uh, laterally, uh, suspend it uh, with, with the uh, malleable uh, retractor, and then just uh, drill the bone uh, here in, in that area that hides the um, inverted papilloma in this very small, uh, oops, cleft, so I pushed, uh, sorry, uh, that we can uh, then remove everything uh, very uh, neatly. 
But it's a bigger problem if the IP is originating from the very lateral frontal sinus, uh, like in this case, that has been already operated uh, three times. Uh, uh, as you can see, uh, uh, this is attaching really very uh, lateral. And as you can see here, the hyperosteosis is in the uh, medial uh, superior portion of the laminar papyrus and the superior uh, wall. Uh, so again, after uh, doing the draft type three and opening up everything, uh, this is uh, the, uh, we tried to suspend periorbital, but anterior atmoral artery is holding it. So we are uh, dissecting it, coagulating it, and, and uh, then we can open and do more dissection. Uh, laterally, we can suspend uh, the uh, periorbita much more better and reach to the uh, dehiscent uh, portion uh, of the uh, tu tumor. And this is exactly where we come uh, around the notch from outside and we can really see uh, everything uh, very uh, laterally with the, uh, with the uh, malleable retractor, we can really open up, up to the very lateral portion and drill every single uh, portion uh, of the uh, 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 frontal sinus uh, in, in this case. And this is the post-operative fourth year uh, of, the, uh, of the case. It is still very nice. And, uh, intact uh, and is very stable. So, uh, papilloma is the most common benign epithelial cyanonasal tumor. It's locally aggressive, uh, have high recurrency tendency, and have potential for malignant transformation, which we should be uh, really uh, well keeping an eye for follow ups. Uh, the, uh, CT and MRI are very important for the uh, diagnosis and, and establishing the attachment point before surgery. Uh, Subperiosteal total resection with bony removal and drilling of the attachment site whenever possible through an endoscopic approach is the, the main treatment today. And for frontal sinus from supraorbital recess, it still remains to be a challenge uh, we may uh, need some advanced techniques and long-term follow-ups are important. And the periorbital suspension technique gives a whole new option in the endoscopic management for far lateral frontal sinus and supraorbital uh, region pathologies in selected uh, cases in this earlier unreachable area through the endonasal uh, approaches. I'd like to thank uh, my collaborators in our department uh, and our, also our neurosurgical colleagues in our skull base group uh, and once again, would like to remind you the, um, the European Congress that will take place in Milano in, in 2022. But in 2021, uh, as member societies of our confederation, we have the meeting uh, once again uh, displaced to uh, autumn 2021, uh, done by my friend uh, Yanis uh, Konstantinidis, uh, the ERS 2021. And, and the, uh, again, the European Skull Base Society meeting in June in, in, in beautiful Riva del Garda in Italy, uh, hopefully where we can meet in person uh, with all of you, uh, uh, not this way. So I, I'd like to thank you for your uh, attendance and uh, Raj, it's, your, it's yours. <laughs>
Thanks, Ken. Great presentation. Thank you. Okay, Ken, I'm going to ask you to address the chat questions once we've finished, okay? But I'm just going to I'm just going to pick your brain a little bit about some of the things that cause me some problems, okay? So, the first time is the best time with inverted papilloma, right? Yeah, that's true. Why? Yes. Why? Why is the first time the best time for surgery? Because we can determine the attachment point much more better. So that is actually what in the clinical practice, what we see people do some kind of polypectomy without taking uh, the, the, having the real diagnosis and, and just uh, doing uh, surgery, uh, just removing the whole tumor almost uh, in name of biopsy, then it's really very hard to find the uh, point where we can really address during surgery. So it might be really very, and, and all the literature as I've tried to delineate uh, is suggesting that. Uh, so uh, so even, when you operate even, on, on recurrences, it's the, the, the uh, chance for a recurrency is nearly one third. Yeah. Of so even though it, even though it's a benign tumor, you are advocating a more comprehensive approach. So you have to almost approach it as if it's a malignancy, right? Yes. That was actually the big problem uh, during the beginning of the uh, uh, endoscopic era, because as I've already mentioned, uh, these were all uh, uh, pictures from my own surgeries of external approaches. We have been really doing and approaching every single inverted papilloma as if it is a malignancy actually. Uh, also due to the problems with the, with the uh, biopsying, you know, uh, because uh, earlier we had also le uh, less uh, probability to take adequate uh, biopsies probably uh, due to the lack of endoscopes also in, in the, in the uh, clinics. Uh, so, so, Kem, when you're managing inverted pap papilloma, right, do you prefer it if a referring surgeon biopsies it, or do you prefer it if they do an extensive attempted resection and then send it to you when it recurs? Sorry, uh, when, when it recurs, it's not a primary. Um, so what is the best approach if you are not... Um, able to do a comprehensive sinus operation. Would you prefer the referring surgeon just to do a small biopsy rather than an attempted clearance? Yeah, that would be the message actually uh, for all attendants. Uh, it would be much more better to, to refer the patient because then the attachment point would not be uh, disturbed uh, and, and the chance for success for the main operating surgeon would be much more higher Otherwise, uh, you, I mean, uh, in, in up to 10% uh, uh, of the cases, there is all, also multicentricity, as I've already mentioned in the beginning. So uh, even we may then encounter uh, the, the, the real attachment point that we may be also missing the second place. Uh, this kind of uh, tumor uh, should really be treated like a malignancy. Okay, and so one final question from me, or one final answer from you. So this is quite cathartic for me, talking to you about inverted papilloma. Um, so problem areas for me, okay? So cribriform olfactory fossa, cribriform area, eustachian tube, um, eustachian tube orifice, and <laughs> beyond the sill of the nose, on the floor of the nose piriform aperture. Mm -hmm. Help me. Okay. So uh, the, the cribriform uh, plate uh, here, uh, as it is not a real confirmed malignancy here, then <laughs> I may, I may, uh, I mean, it's, 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 it's really difficult. Nice questions. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you. The, the, the thing is that uh, then 
does it justify to make uh, a CSF leak while trying to remove everything completely? It comes to that question, actually. Uh, and without any, any um, solid uh, malignancy, I may really still do a subperiosteal dissection, not uh, take the bone away, uh, and try not to cause a, a, a CSF leak, then follow up uh, that patient with not two eyes, but perhaps eight eyes, you know. Uh, that would be, you know, much uh, important because if it is a, a, a real malignancy, then, I mean, you know, if it comes, uh, then a, a malignancy and the definitive histopathology, a synchronous then I would go and do an anterior cranial uh, resection. Uh, then, uh, because the patient would uh, probably also require uh, intraoperative uh, 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 radiation therapy. Uh, so, and maybe, so maybe, Kem, you and I will pick up um, a therapy session on the eustachian tube and uh, the floor of the nose when okay. we're working next together over a strong coffee, okay? So well, I'll that, leave you I will be really happy. Uh, <laughs> I, I really miss all my colleagues who have been speaking uh, since early in the morning. So uh, since uh, last March, we haven't been really seeing each other in person. It's, uh, I'm really looking okay. forward to the next conferences next year. Yeah, me too, me too. I'll leave you to answer the questions on the chat function and the Q&A, okay? Thanks for... Thanks okay, for uh, thank, you. thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Kim, and uh, thanks, Raj. It was a wonderful hosting. The head and neck surgeries you perform are vital. Your patients place their trust in you. You help them continue to speak and smile, eat and drink, hear and comfort. You're committed to helping them continue to live fully, to feel deeply, and to enjoy the quality of life they've come to expect. That means being confident that you're protecting and preserving your patient's head and neck nerve function during procedures. Introducing NIM Vital, the next generation of nerve monitoring technology. NIM Vital provides advanced nerve monitoring that helps you reduce the risk of nerve damage during head and neck procedures. Detailed intraoperative nerve condition information helps inspire your surgical strategy. An intuitive user interface with a wire-free patient interface allows for easy setup and enhanced visualization from the surgical field. Real-time notifications of nerve conditions, visually and audibly. Green, yellow, and red status bars provide visual information, and their associated tones provide audible cues, making monitoring function easier than ever. NIM Nerve Trend EMG reporting enables nerve condition tracking throughout a procedure, even when using intermittent nerve monitoring. And when paired with a NIM continuous monitoring electrode, you have continuous nerve monitoring informing your surgical strategy. NIM Vital pushes the boundaries of monitoring nerve function in various procedures in head and neck surgery. With real-time information available during surgery, giving you confidence in nerve function. Because protecting patients' nerves and senses is more than vital. NIM Vital.
Imagine, what if you could do even more to bring relief to your chronic rhinosinusitis patients? With technology customized to your unique clinical and facility needs. Introducing Stealth Station Flex ENT Navigation System. A customizable system from Medtronic ENT, a market leader in image-guided surgery technology. Featuring six hardware configurations, an optional portable cart, two different electromagnetic emitter options. With flexibility in hardware design and optional software functionality, get everything you need and nothing you don't with Stealth Station Flex ENT. Let's flex forward. Contact your Medtronic representative to customize a navigation solution that's right for you.